Father God, we come before you. We thank you for being with us uh, all throughout this time where we uh, can learn and study from the book of Hebrews. We thank you for this great salvation you have proclaimed to us through uh, your people. Uh, that now we can know Jesus, we can be recipients of the blessings that he has achieved and accomplished for us. And we pray, Father, as we come to, this, to the end of this book, may we be able to look to him, fix our eyes upon Jesus Christ. May we appreciate him all the more. May we also see the Old Testament as a rich book, a rich book that points to Jesus Christ. And we pray, Father, that um, uh, at the end of this, we are able to obey him. We are able to be more like him as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, there's uh, it's going to be a lot of information today, so I'm going to hopefully run uh, quickly through some stuff, uh, and then I'm going to get you to discuss some things as well. So, we're in uh, session 13, Hebrews chapter 13. So, a quick recap from session 12, uh, from Hebrews chapter 12. So, the ultimate example of persevering in faith is Jesus Christ himself. So, we look through chapter 11, right, the Hall of Fame of Faith, where he goes through the list of Old Testament characters. By faith, they did all of these things. They persevered. And the ultimate example of that is Jesus Christ himself. He persevered for the joy set before him. He endured the cross, scorned his shame, and completed his work of salvation for his people. So he is the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Therefore, we look to him so that we do not grow weary in our souls, so that we can persevere in our faith. Christians will face struggles and hardships in our life, in our race, in our Christian uh, walk and journey. And the pastor calls us to endure these hardships as God's discipline for us. Discipline of growing us in Christ-likeness, in our holiness. So we're going to change our mindset to think about our struggles, our um, suffering in life, to think about what is God doing and disciplining us, and how is He growing us to be more like Jesus. It shows us that we are indeed his children. And unlike the Old Testament saints who fell away, Old Testament saints, Old Testament characters, figures, saints is probably the wrong word to use. Old Testament characters who fell away, we, the New Testament believers in Christ, we have come to a different mountain, one of glory, joy, and gladness. So that's from chapter 12, 18 to 24. So we saw that the mountain that they've come to at Mount Sinai is darkness, gloom, and um, storm as we have come to a joyful mountain. Jesus will come again in the future to wipe away all sins from creation, and it is only those who are part of the unshakable kingdom that will remain, and those who are in Christ, who believe in Christ, we are part of that unshakable kingdom, and therefore we should be thankful, and we worship God with reverence and awe. So that's at the end of chapter 12. Chapter 13, so if you look at um, your notes, it seems like in the first reading, there is a sudden change in tone and style in his writing or in his sermon. So that has caused some uh, scholars to say, this is just tacked on at the end. This is just an appendix, an addendum to the book. Um, it only appears as a collection of miscellaneous commands to his hearers. But if you look carefully and read carefully, the last chapter draws on everything that he has touched on in the previous 12 chapters, and he makes concrete application based on those key themes. Uh, and the one transition that we can see is in the last two verses of chapter 12. So in 12, 28 to 29, he exhorts his hearers to a life of thankfulness, a life of worship of God in reverence and awe. And so that passage, according to Cockrell, is the bond that unites chapters 1 to 12 with the verses that follow. It is the richest description of the life of faith, as it is lived by those who experience what God has done in Christ. And then he goes on to explain what that looks like. And makes that concrete. So that happens a lot in the letters, in the um, epistles. So let me give you a quick example. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Right? Sometimes we ask these questions uh, and we find it hard to answer them. But a lot of times, what we need to do, really, is just read on. Read on. Because he explains for us. So, Ephesians chapter 5. Is everybody there? Let me read very quickly. Ephesians is in the New Testament. Okay, chapter 5, verse... Let me see. Okay, verse 17. I'll just wait for everybody to turn there. Okay. 
Okay, verse 17. So this is what Paul says, chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. What is the Lord's will? Well, let's keep on reading. It is, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Wait, what does that mean? What does that mean to be filled in the Spirit? And obviously, a lot of people have their own understanding of what that means. But what does Paul mean? Easy way to find out? Read on. So, read it in context. So, let's go there. Be filled with the Spirit. What does that mean? Speaking to one another with the, um, one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from the heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of Lord Jesus. So what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? It means to speak to one another with psalms, hymns, songs, and from the Spirit. It is not something that is mysterious. Paul answers that for us. We just have to keep on reading. Um, and then if you go on, uh, so verse 21, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. What does that mean? How does that look like? Keep reading, verse 22 onwards. So a lot of times when we see certain passages and uh, commands or things that we find mysterious that we don't understand, how do we find out the meaning of it? We keep reading. So same way, we come to Hebrews chapter 12, right? At the end of Hebrews chapter 12, where it says, Since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful. So worship God acceptably with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. What does that look like? What does that mean in everyday life? Keep reading. And we come to chapter 13. So sometimes those chapter headings are not very helpful because it divides up. Um, try to, when you read the scriptures, to ignore them and just keep reading what that looks like. So chapter 13 then is a continuation. It shows us in concrete terms what it means to be thankful and what it means to worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. And in chapter 13, there is one verse that is very famous and one verse that everybody has used before or heard before, I'm pretty sure. That's in verse 8. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Right? I'm sure every one of you have heard that before. I'm sure every one of you probably have used that before. Before we go on to look at chapter 13, what I want you to do, just in the people along your table, discuss with one another, how have you seen or heard this verse applied? Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. How has this verse been applied in your experience? So have a quick chat, and then we'll come back to talk about it. So, what are some of the answers that you gave about how this verse has been applied or used in everyday life? Well, yes. I can remember it has been used in prayer, mm -hmm. but I can't remember any specific people. Okay, yeah. So people have prayed this. How? Jenny can't remember. Anyone else? Unchanging nature or character, okay. So it's about the, the same character or nature of Jesus um, throughout the centuries, okay. Mm -hmm. Great I am. Mm -hmm. So eternal God, great I am, therefore Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, okay. Yeah, Jesus died yesterday mm. for my sins mm -hmm. and today and tomorrow. So Jesus died, Jesus has. Mm -hmm. and it's happening still, and it's, he's, saving, he's saving us on the cross, mm -hmm. happened, and it still happens today, and it will happen tomorrow. So he is still saving us all the time, sort of thing. Okay, all right. He can be used as well when people waver in their faith. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can say, okay, Jesus is still the same yesterday, yep. today, and tomorrow. So used as a way to encourage people who has doubts or wavering in their faith, okay? Anyone else? Have you heard anywhere or any other way that's been applied or used this verse? Yes, Jesus is the truth. Mm -hmm. When I return. Mm -hmm. He's the truth, never change. Yep, okay. Yep. Alright, so keep all of the answers you've given me. Think about that. Keep it in your head. We're going to come to Hebrews chapter 13 and see how the pastor actually uses it. I'm sure some of you will be quite surprised by that. Um, uh, I'm not saying every other use is illegitimate, uh, but if you look carefully, what he uses is very interesting. Um, so let me read from Hebrews chapter 13, from verse 1 to 25. Hebrews chapter 13. 
Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison, and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. Marriage should be honoured by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Keep your lives from free from the love of money, and be content with what you have, because God has said, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, The Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. It is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not by eating ceremonial foods, which is of no benefit of to those who do so. We have an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacle have no right to eat. The high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. For here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for, us, for the city that is to come. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer God to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess His name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority, because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work may be a joy, not a burden for that will be of no benefit to you. Pray for us. We are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably in every way. I particularly urge you to pray so that I may be restored to you soon. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with every good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I urge you to bear with my word of exhortation. For in fact, I have written to you quite briefly. <laughs> I want you to know that our brother Timothy has been released. If he arrives soon, I will come with him to see you. Greet all your leaders and all the Lord's people. Those from Italy send you their greetings. Grace be with you all. So 13 chapters, it is written very briefly. So according to... Yeah, very briefly. It's not very long. Yeah, so... Um, so I think this uh, chapter can be divided up very neatly into three, sort of three sections. So one to six, uh, there we have four pairs of commands telling the hearers how to live faithfully and a life of godly fear as a people of God. Seven to 17 essentially is about the call to imitate, submit, and remember, and have confidence in their leaders. And then finally, 18 to 25 is the ending, the benediction, and the final greetings to uh, the people of God. So we're going to look to each section. So section number one, a faithful life of gratitude and holy fear. So from Hebrews 1, uh, 13, 1 to 6. So in, in uh, verse 1, keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Now, in an alternate translation, you can translate that as let brotherly love continue. Now, I give you the Greek word there. Can any one of you read that Greek word there? Philadelphia, Philadelphia yeah. Philadelphia. Philadelphia. So, Philadelphia means brotherly love. From two words, phileo, phileo means love, or philo. Adelphos, Adelphos is brethren, brothers, and sisters. So, when you, when you hear their brothers and sisters as Adelphos, so Philadelphia is a brotherly love with one another. And that's where the name comes from of that city in America as well, Philadelphia. Uh, it depends on how it's used. So um, agape love. So, okay, so C.S. Lewis has made this very popular. So where he talks about four different kinds of love, you have phileo love, agape love, eros, and you have stoga. And then he says, Greek has these four words used to describe four different kinds of love in the Bible uh, and uh, therefore and therefore when we come across these words we must think about those those sort of things 
Unfortunately, language does not work like that. All right, so um, just because you read phileo or agape in the scriptures doesn't necessarily mean means the same thing in every situation. You must always look at the context. The concept behind that is right, right? So there is a concept such as brotherly love, which we just see. Concept of unconditional love, which we, we will we see in agape uh, sometimes. And also um, erotic love and things like that. So th those concepts are right. The issue is we are tying those concepts to particular words. All right, so there are parts of, say, for example, in the LXX, that is the Greek Old Testament, where the word agape is used to describe rape. So don't tie a concept to that word. Okay, so um, always look at the context of the scriptures to see how that is used. Um, so sometimes it is helpful, sometimes it is not. Always look at the context to determine the meaning of the sentence. It's, it's the, we do the same with English anyway. Uh, English does that all the time. So if I say the word run, that can mean a million other things. We have to look at the context of how I use that word. So running a business is very different from running along the beach. But straight away we know, you know the difference between those two. Uh, so it's the same thing with any Greek word that we come across. Don't tie a concept to the, that particular word. Look at the context, very important. So, uh, Philadelphia, Phileo, um, brotherly love. So, with these four um, exhortations over the next uh, three verses, so number one is keep on loving one another. Me, yes. Is there a love uh, as far as I know, yes. So, when God. Is the here? Yes, so this is a love among the people of God. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Uh, agape generally. Or rather, the unconditional love is generally used by uh, to describe God's love for us. This is generally, or again, generally not always used to talk about love amongst the brothers and sisters in Christ in the community. Yes. Um, where was I? Okay. So for exhortation, show, uh, show, uh, keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Uh, show hospitality. That's number two. Honor marriage, keep lives free from uh, love of money. So th these are the four exhortations. I notice um, when he uses brothers and sisters, that Christ has called those who believe in him as brothers and sisters in chapter 2, if you remember. Chapter 2, 11 and 12. So we are part of the same family, same household together. right? We are all related in and through Christ in that way. So we are brothers and sisters in Christ because of what Christ has done. Uh, and he asked us to keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. So it's not something that we show once for one week or one time on Sunday and then we forget about No, no, it's keep on doing it. It's a continuous action. So he's calling them to keep on showing love to one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. So we treat each other as siblings. And then the next verse in verse 2, I think. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. If you know your Old Testament well, what would you be thinking of straight up? What incident would you be thinking of? Exactly, the three that say, came to see Abraham, or the, one, the, the, some, the thing that happened to Lot. So that's Abraham and Sarah in Genesis 18, where they come, these three men, we don't know who they were. When we first read it, we don't know whether they're angels or not. They, uh, Abraham asked Sarah to serve them. They were served. And then suddenly they gave that pronouncement that, oh, by this time next year, Sarah will be pregnant and give birth. And then if you keep reading, and it's like, wait a minute. These are not three normal men. Um, uh, so the indication is that they may be angels. Same thing with the each in with Lot in Genesis 19. That is a very strange incident, a uh, very sad incident as well about Sodom and Gomorrah. But basically the idea is there are two men who came to visit him. He provided hospitality to them. He showed hospitality to them without knowing how to, they turned out to be angels. And, and they protected him uh, when God came and judged Sodom and Gomorrah. If you know your Old Testament well, that's one of the things that you will think about very quickly. Because um, it is a very prominent passage. <clears throat> so he's asking them, don't forget to show hospitality to strangers. 
For by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. So we want to be hospitable to people. Um, and sometimes when, as we do that, we will have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. And to continue on with the same idea of showing hospitality, verse 3, we remember those in prison as if we were together with them in prison. So, in chapter 10, verse 33 and 34, if you, have, uh, if you remember that passage, where they, the pastor alludes that there might be some amongst them who have been imprisoned for their faith. So, uh, verse 34, chapter 10, you suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possession. So one of the things that the pastor asked them to do is don't forget those who have been in prison because sometimes it is easy for us to forget those uh, who are not part of in our midst, you know, out of sight, out of mind sort of thing. Uh, easy to forget that. So he asked them to remember them. Don't forget about them. Uh, and later on he says, those who are mistreated as uh, as if you yourselves were suffering. So remember those in prison. Remember those who are mistreated. So that mistreated, that word, is the same word as used to describe. Where have we heard that word before? Jesus and the cross? Yes, but before Jesus. We read this in chapter 11. Yes, more specifically, which person in the Old Testament? Which um, account, rather, in chapter 11? Oh. Moses, yes, that's right. So Moses chapter 11, verse 25. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God, rather, to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. So he's still, again, alluding back to what he talked about. But remember those people who have been mistreated. Remember to show hospitality to them, remember them, uh, and as if you were suffering along with them. Um, so choose to empathize and be with them in their suffering. Uh, so don't forget about those who are suffering in our midst. Okay, and then he very quickly move on to marriage. All, again, they're all in some sense related uh, to showing brotherly love to one another. Uh, because if you don't remember those in prison, if you do not honor the marriage bit, if you don't keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have, you are not showing brotherly love to one another, isn't it? You're not showing love to each other as brothers and sisters. So in verse 4, he's talking about the honouring of marriage by everybody. It, marriage bed should be kept pure. So that's the same uh, thing. So marriage should be honoured by all. The, mar uh, the marriage bed should be kept pure. It's talking about the same thing, just using different words. Uh, but what is trying to say that marriage bed be kept pure is talking about um, not violating the marriage covenant through sexual relationships outside of marriage. So keep the sexual integrity of marriage within marriage and not outside of it. Why? For God, for God judges, for God judges the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Right, so part of sexual immorality then is, if you think about it, is an expression of selfishness because it's all about yourself. It involves setting personal gratification above responsibility to God and above your love to your brothers and sisters in Christ. Right? So if you're sexually immoral, you are not loving your brothers and sisters in Christ. Above all, like not, you're not just disobeying God, you're not loving your brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, in what way? Because you destroy the fabric and the trust of the community. And tied together very closely with that is the idea of greed. So verse 4, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Now in English, we don't see the word play that the pastor here um, uh, displays. So if you know Greek, which is I quoted some of them to you there, 
th there is a, a particular rhythm, a particular sound to it. So keep on showing brotherly love, Philadelphia, hospitality. Anyone can read that? Philosenias, without love of money, Aphilaguros. Uh, so that's a particular rhythm to it. So Philadelphia, Philosenia, Aphilagur. Right, so again, if you think about a preacher, sometimes a preacher uses these same word plays and as they preach. Uh, and as sometimes, um, for example, like when I preach, sometimes I use alliteration in my points. Right? In my previous sermon, guard your heart, guard the truth. Same word, but it's just help people to remember that. The pastor does the same. And this is part of the reason why I think this is a sermon as well. Uh, there's a particular word play to it that you can um, see. Yes. Which one is that level? Uh, that's the second one. Um, show hospitality. Yeah, love of strangers. So, xenia, xenophobia, same word. Love of other people you don't know. Um, uh, hot strangers. So, philosthenius is to show love to, um, or show hospitality to strangers, rather. And notice, <clears throat> keep your lives free from the love of money. Not keep your lives free from money. Right? Money in of itself is not wrong or bad. Money itself can do many things. Money allows us to have this building to do our courses in. Right? Uh, so money in of itself is not bad. But the danger is we are easily swayed by and tempted by money. That love of money is very deceiving. So we want to keep ourselves from the love of money. How? Be content with what we have. All right, so in verse where is that? five, be content with what you have. If we are content with what we have, then we can keep ourselves from the love of money. Because if we are not content with what we have, what do we want? We want more. To have more, what do we do? We want more money so that we can have more. And that's exactly what our world is trying to do to us. Right? What it's been trying to do, uh, our world, especially um, uh, many, many companies, is that they try to sow dissatisfaction into our lives so that we want to buy more and more things. You know, your five-year-old phone. Yes, it's still perfectly functional and usable. Why don't you get a new one? It's much better, isn't it? Why are you sticking with an old phone that um, is not the newest model anymore? Or the car, or whatever might be in, at home. Or not just material things, it could be experiences. Come to this trip now, right? now it's a bit hard. But come to this trip and go for this experience you know, instead of just staying in Perth your whole life, how boring is that? No, you've got to experience something new. So all everything in our, uh, in our modern world now is trying to sow dissatisfaction is so that you can spend money to these companies to get new things or new experiences, the new whatever it might be. Um, so it's trying to sow discontent in our own hearts. Uh, and it's not only in our world. So a lot of Christendom, they do the same. Yeah, how they advertise. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, even in within Christian circles, I've seen how certain conferences or you know courses, you know, uh, have a life that's filled with a fresh uh, feeling of the spirit in your life. Come and learn about that, and then they like they try to sow this sort of discontent in your own spiritual life. Therefore, you pay money to go to this course so that whether the claim is right or wrong, that you can have this new experience, right? So um, sometimes for Christ, uh, in a, within the Christian church, we do that as well. We try to sow that discontent so that we can get more stuff. So be aware of that. Very dangerous. Um, but the idea is we want to be content with what we have. Why? Because he quotes from Deuteronomy or Joshua. Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. We are content with what we have because we have 
God. We have God. So part of why we can be discontent sometimes is that we find meaning, we find security, we find value, we find our dignity in the things of this world. But the pastor comes and says, no, no, no. Be content with what you have because you have God. You have God. God says, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Uh, he quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 6. It could also be from Joshua chapter 1, verse 5, when, um, when uh, God text talks to Joshua. Deuteronomy 31, verse 6 is when Moses reassures Joshua that God will not leave him as he takes over from Moses. And who else has said that? Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Jesus, Jesus. where does he say it? Matthew 28, verse 20, yes. What does he say? Thank you. Surely I'll be with you always to the very end of the age. Yeah, exactly. Matthew chapter 20, verse, chapter 28, verse 20. So that's a great commission passage that we talked about all the time. Now, sometimes we miss this part because we talk about evangelism, we talk about missions, we have to send people to do mission and work, etc., etc. We don't talk about Jesus at the end says, Surely I'm with you always to the end of the age. Jesus is with us as we do all these things. In some senses, exactly the same what he what God says, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. And because God never leaves us, we can be content. We find our meaning, we find our security in God and God alone. And therefore, we can say with confidence. So um, verse 6 is translated a few different ways. So some translates, so let us say with confidence. Uh, this is translated. So we say with confidence. So some people have said because of that, um, verse 6 is something that they say as a congregation together, which I think is a great idea. Uh, anyways, but the idea is that they say it together, Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? If God never leaves us, if God never forsakes us, therefore we can say with great confidence, God is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? If God is for us, what can be, who can be against us? Who said that? Anyone else? Paul, yes. Which chapter? Eight, yeah, well done, yeah. Paul, Paul says that in Romans chapter 8, if God is for us, then who can be against us? Again, same point here. If the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? If God never leaves us, God never forsakes us, and we're talking about the God of the universe here. Right? If God is, this God is for us, who can be against us? Right? Who can win? God is my helper. Who? So part of that, as we do this, is that um, we are to remind ourselves, sometimes we need to speak to ourselves, this truth. Sometimes we forget that. The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? That's a great verse to memorize if you need to memorize a verse. Right? The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. If God is for us, who can be against us? Mere mortals can do nothing to us. So let me read um, very quickly what um, Cockrell says. These exaltations draw on themes that are common in Christian and Jewish moral teachings. Nor are they without parallel in pagan sources. Now, that's a I read that a few times, like, what on earth are you saying? Basically, you're saying there are some parallels in pagan sources. There's a double negative there. There's a terrible way of writing, but that's why he writes. Um, uh, however, the pastor's selection and careful combination of these themes are his own. They take on new meaning as, a, as the proper expression of all feel gratitude for the all-sufficient work of Christ. They are also integral to what the pastor has taught about the nature of God's people as his household. Remember that? made up of his children who are brothers and sisters of Christ and of one another. Okay? So, uh, with that, let's have a quick discussion, just again with the people on your table. Which of these commands, commands do you think the people of God are most lacking in our obedience? How can we encourage that obedience in that area? Okay, so just talk to the people uh, on your table, have a quick chat, and then we'll come back and talk about it. Let's uh, share a bit about what you have discussed.
So all these four exhortations or commands that we read in chapter 13, 1, 1 to 6, which of those commands do you think the people of God are most lacking today? Or lacking in obedience? Mm-hmm. Yeah, love of money in the Western world. Okay. Mm. Because the world says everything is about you. Mm. So I start with you. Yeah. God says everything is about yeah. other people. Yeah. I'll take care of you. Yeah. So that, that advertising is everywhere. Yeah. You know? yeah. And you feel like it's affected or influenced the it church? Is, it's hard to. Yeah. It's hard not to. Yeah. So first that strong. how do you then encourage, you know, obedience in that area then? What would you do? Use the money for good. Okay. Yeah. All right. Do, do, do help that yep. Yeah. Mm. Yep. Yeah. So. Yep. Give it away. Yep. Yep. Hmm. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Store up treasures in heaven. Yeah. Thank you, Yanni. Anyone else? Any other thoughts? Yeah, this this morning and last week. Yep, is to is to trust in the Lord. Did you say? Yeah. 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 You think we're not very good at hospitality in general? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, we're not as friendly as we should be. Yep. Yes. Hmm. Yeah. Which some people do, and a lot of people don't. Mm, mm. Um, but then the idea of what Abraham did, that mm. was the strangest case. That's right, yeah. yeah. I would be very hesitant. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm, that's right. Um, so the hospitality uh, is a, a little bit more than just inviting somebody over for lunch. Yep. Um, it is more than that. So it's part of that is sharing what you have with with these strangers as well. Um, uh, some some involves you know staying overnight or just providing some shelter to those people who may not have any shelter or people who might. So uh, I think a good example is sometimes we have or we hear of missionaries coming back for a furlough. They need a place to stay. It's a place to say that's that's showing hospitality. So it's more than mere meals. Meals is part of that, yeah. not not just that. There is more to it. Yeah. Or well, sometimes you know missionaries come back. We need a car, uh, and there have been people who are very generous to provide use of a car for those missionaries as well. So there's you know it's more to it. There's absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, why do you think that is, Jenny? What do you th- what do you think is a change between now and what it was like for Abraham and how can we deal with that or think about that? Well, it was part of it. It wasn't just Abraham. It mm. was hospitality, I think, was more expected. Mhm. Mhm. Plus, he was the man and there were lots of other people around. Yeah. Yeah. But see, me. Mhm. Yes. That's right. Yes, exactly. Yep. So, so it's a diff- very different world as well. So, um, I'm not saying we don't do that. I'm not saying we should do that. I'm saying let's be careful and wise about it. Um, like what we, like what I preached on uh, a few weeks back. Um, the world in those days, in Abraham's days, if people are traveling and need a place to stay, they can't just book a hotel like we can today. It's a very different world. So if they need a place to stay, they are dependent on other people to provide that. Whereas today is very different, where if you need a place to say, well, there's Airbnb, there's hotels that you can do that. I'm not saying Christians can't provide places to stay, you can, but again, let's be wise about it, because sometimes there are really unscrupulous um, characters that will take advantage of our generosity as well. So, not saying you can't, but I'm saying uh, let's be careful about it, but at the same time, we definitely could be a lot more generous than what we are currently. So an example that was given to me, especially in the Jewish community, 
is that uh, this story was told to me where there's a Jewish businessman, or I can't remember what it was, where he was stranded at a city because his flight got cancelled. He needed a place to stay at night. He calls his friend who's a Jew in that city. Within an hour, they managed to find somebody for him to stay in somebody's house. So I think there's something we can do as Christians in the sense that, you know, I have a Christian friend who oh, gets stranded here because of X, Y, and Z reason. Is there a place for me to stay for one night? You know, and you can tell your friend who asks another friend, and I'm sure that should be okay. So if I have a friend who says, oh, you know, I have a friend who's over here, they need a place to stay, I'm happy to let them stay at my place. Precisely because I, my friend knows that friend, you know. So in that case, I think we can be very much more generous and more hospitable instead of here's a random guy off the street. Um, uh, that we all want to be careful as well, especially if you have children in the house uh, as well. Yeah. When, I was, when I was a young child, mm. they always had the saying that the community uh, brings up the children. That's right, yeah. So we were so much more community oriented, mm-hmm. and today we're just singly oriented. That's right, yeah. And the church can bring that community back. That's right. And one of the good things that some schools are doing, they do that, which is uh, excellent. So the school that I send my kids to, they do a lot of, um, they make a lot of effort to trying to build that kind of community, which is great, which is wonderful. Uh, so they try to uh, foster events or create events that foster these kind of relationship amongst the parents, which is great um, because, yeah, we're missing that, as, as you mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I just remember there was a chap once mm. who needed help, mm. needed a place to stay. Mm. He couldn't stay with some places because he was incontinent. Mm. And it was a horrible winter's night. And mm. I didn't know what to do. I, I mm. mm. And I didn't know what to do. Mm. So, you know, that, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. We, we do, uh, if you don't know, yeah, we do have a list of places that people can go to. Yeah, so, um, because we do have p- homeless people or people coming into the office to beg for or ask for money and things like that. And so we do have a document that's ready to help them along the way. Um, uh, yeah, and they can contact them as well. So let me know and I'm happy to send that document to you. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Anyone else? Any other commands that you think that we're lacking in? Um, I don't think that we do very much of visiting people in prison. Mm, mm. As a whole, I, I think you're probably right. We do, if you don't know, David does run, um, uh, currently anyway, so I think it's uh, about to finish. Uh, he's trying to run Alpha in a prison. So he's been doing that over the past month, uh, every Friday. Um, and they'll just go to prison, talk to them, and run Alpha uh, with, with uh, the prison. Um, so we, we do that. It's just, you know, sometimes we don't announce everything that we do. So. Um, but obviously, like what Susie said, I think we can do more of that as well. And there are ministries that try to get and partner with churches to do more of that as well. Yeah. And an extension of that, mm. um, being aware of what Christians in other parts of the world are going through. That's right, yeah. Being aware of what they, well, they, are, they are going through, the persecution. Which, again, will come to the church at Eritrea this coming Christmas, which Ben will talk about more. Yeah. Okay, one more, then we'll, we'll continue. No? Uh, Yeah, so I think what um, we can look at is that obviously the people of God as a whole, there are many many areas that we can always improve on, you know, improve on in our obedience to God. But overall, as Subi Church, I would say as this community, I think we are doing 
quite well in that sense. We are very, 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 very blessed. Um, um, so generally, I think uh, as a whole, I'm not saying we're perfect. I think there are many areas that we can improve on. But as a whole, I think as a church, we're doing uh, all these things that, uh, as we mentioned here in chapter 13, 1 to 6. Uh, obviously, of course, we can improve more as we just talked about. But overall, I think we are uh, very blessed to be part of a community that loves to do all these things. All right, let's very quickly go to chapter uh, 13, 7 to 17, uh, and then we'll go on a break very shortly. So, verse 7. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life. Imitate their faith. So in um, verse 7, he asked them to remember their leaders. So remember that the past has been warning them against the disobedience of the wilderness generation in chapters 3 and 4. Don't be like them, right? They fell away. They did not persevere. Be like these people in chapter 11, Right, or the, in the Old Testament, like Jesus. And then he comes to tell us, ask them to remember their leaders. So these are leaders who spoke the word of God to you. So most likely, he's talking about leaders who have passed on, who have died. But remember your past leaders. And these past leaders spoke the word of God to you. Look at what these leaders did. They spoke the word of God to them. And if you have, again, remember all throughout the book of Hebrews, the importance of the word, the word of God, right? So these are leaders most likely talking about those leaders who have first announced the great gospel message to them. So chapter 2, let's go to chapter 2 very quickly. Verse 1 to 4, chapter 2. Okay, everyone there? Okay, so let me just read verse 1 and 3. We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. So don't, we don't drift away, don't fall away, persevere. Verse 3, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? This salvation, this great salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, by Jesus, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. Right. This same salvation was confirmed to us, preached to us by those who heard him and testified to it via signs, wonders, and various miracles. So this is likely talking about leaders who did, who first preached this gospel message to these Hebrews who spoke the word of God to them. And he's asking them to remember these leaders who spoke the word of God to you, consider the outcome of their way of life. So think about the entire life. Think about not just about their deaths, think about the impact, the total impact of the way of life that they have pursued, a life of faithfulness. Think of these, these leaders that you have, imitate their faith, imitate their life, imitate what they did, imitate their faithfulness to God. They were faithful amid difficulty until the end. So think about these leaders of yours, so again, we have a great example uh, as we remember Joseph today, you know. So think about your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life. Consider the outcome of Joseph's life, what he has done and accomplished throughout his life. Imitate his faith. Imitate their faith. All right. So that's what he's asking them to do. So, yeah, or Graham. That's right, Graham Johnson uh, and uh, what he did. And what he spoke the word of God to us. So these leaders then set an example for the congregation to follow. Right? So you have an example that you should not follow in the wilderness generation, chapters 3 and 4. Examples that you should follow in chapters 11. Examples that you should follow in Jesus, chapter 12. Now, remember your past leaders who have died. Follow their example. Follow their way of life. Follow their faith. So they set an example for the congregation. And then that's where we come to verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So with that in mind, based on the context, what do you think he's trying to say with verse 8, with this Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever? And how is it supposed to be applied to the people? Think about that. 
it's 3 o'clock. We're going to have a five minute break, and as we have a break, chat with the people along uh, in your table. All right, so five minute break, and we'll come back. Um, hopefully, you had a good discussion about how we can interpret and apply verse 8. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So, how sh based on the context, how what should it mean and how should it be applied? Anyone can answer this. Yes, based on the context, Anetta? Yep. Mm hmm. So hold fast to the word, i.e. Jesus, um, and uh, because it's the same message. Or something. I, think, I think you can also explain, like, he chooses the word, maybe. He chooses the word and uses the practice of the gospel or something. Mm. Because he also wants to make this whole um, idea about the identity of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's why he brings it to the practice of the gospel. Yeah, okay, cool. Thank you. Thanks, Anara. Anyone else? Strange to know that Hebrews never said that Jesus is the Word. No. Uh, in that in that way, he, like he he is the Word that God speaks, but he doesn't equate Jesus as the Word. He's the one that preaches the Word. <laughs> All right, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. All right. Anyone else? You're, you're close. I'm not saying you're wrong. Just a little bit more precise, I think. We'll get there. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. 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 So you have to be very careful of other um, teachings, mm. you know, that mm. may not be the same. Yeah. So whatever that is important, that, mm. that someone that has already witnessed it, mm. that is the one that will heal. Mm. So that same message that someone has witnessed it, yes. that has preached to you, is the same message. Yes. Remember that. Okay, yep. Yeah. All right. Anyone else? Hmm. The same, yeah. Without sin, and the, the, his um, way of life is always the same. Yep. Anyone else? Yes. Could, could be another link. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And now, if we taught ourselves, we have to practice that love, love, mm -hmm. love, and everything. Yeah. And even next Sunday, forever, yeah. you know, in future, yeah. that principle still holds. Okay, so that same principle that we read in verses 1 to 6 hold that same principle. Okay, cool. Um, yes, Susie. Okay. Yep. 
so it's the same Jesus that um, we're going to be with in the future. So all of your answers, I think or all of you are correct, um, or rather, you're on the right track. So I think the idea is, if you remember in verse 7, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you, remember their life, remember um, the people that he listed in chapter 11, all these people who live by faith in God, in Christ in some sense. So he is the same yesterday with these leaders that you just, you knew, right? The same uh, Jesus that, for example, Joseph and Graham had faith in. That's the same Jesus that we have faith in today. And he's going to be the same Jesus tomorrow. So the same Jesus that helped them persevere in their faith, who the same message that you heard is going to be the same Jesus yesterday, today, and forever. That's not going to change. And therefore, next sentence, do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teaching. Don't be swayed by a different teaching about who Jesus is or what he has accomplished. Which is, again, sometimes very similar to Galatians chapter 1. If anyone who were to preach to you another gospel, let him be damned. Um, this is the author or the pastor of Hebrew who will say the same thing. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teaching. So it's about persevering in our faith to Christ, the same Christ that our, our past leaders depended on, the same Christ that we're depending upon, the same Christ that Abraham believed in. He might not know the name Christ or Jesus. He believed in the same God. We, are, we have faith in that very same God, and we will always have faith in that same God forever. Right, so he's talking about persevering on, believing in the same gospel message. Um, uh, so we imitate our leaders of the past because then we can depend on God's faithfulness since God's faithfulness doesn't change. God's faithfulness to us in Christ. What Christ has done for us doesn't change. And like Abraham, we look forward to a city that God prepares for us in that sense. So it's the same God that we believe in. Which means that verse 9, do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teaching. It makes sense, right? Think the, the gospel message doesn't change. So in verse, where is it? Verse 9, do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teaching. It is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace. So our hearts are strengthened by grace. is not by eating ceremonial food, which is of no benefit of those who do so. So you can eat ceremonial food and things like that, but our hearts is not going to be strengthened by those things. It is of no benefit. How is our heart strengthened by? Strengthened by grace. Grace that's shown to us in and through the work of Christ. Right? Now what does he mean by ceremonial food? Uh, there are a few different options that the scholars give. Could be about food laws in the Old Testament. Uh, I don't think so. I think it's talking more about some Jewish food rituals that has popped up since then that uh, some scholars believe to be that. But the idea is we are not strength, our hearts are not strengthened by these things. Our hearts are strengthened by grace that we know in Christ. So, exactly, the cross, that's right. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, Christ is sufficient to strengthen us. Christ is the one who gives us strength to persevere in our faith. Um, so, but if we depend on something else, we weaken the work of Christ. If we are saying the work of Christ is not enough, we need something else. That's not true. Christ is enough. Um, so verse 10, we have an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacle have no right to eat. So uh, we have an altar. Uh, if you notice, there's a short note there from uh, Peter O'Brien. He says it's a cultic altar, it's a cultic term. So the, the word cultic, don't think cult of today. When scholars use cultic, it means a temple practice. Right? It's a temple practice, cultic term used in shorthand and figurative way for the many dimensions of Christ's death. So altar, we know it is from the temple or the tabernacle. So it's a cultic term, it's a term that the temple uses, uh, has something to do with the temple, used in a shorthand and figurative way for the many dimensions of Christ's death. His sacrifice is the source of both the saving and sustaining grace by which our hearts are strengthened. 
So we have this altar, we have this work of Christ, from which those who minister at the tabernacle, so that's uh, one phrase taken together, those who minister at the tabernacle is, are those who come to God or worship God according to the old covenant means that we talked about. These people who worship God or come to God through old covenant means, they, <coughs> they have no right to eat from this altar in that sense. They have no right to um, come to God in that sense because they are still worshiping God through Old Testament, Old Covenant means. <coughs> Excuse me. So with that altar, that cultic term, the temple language, um, it's not surprising that verse eleven suddenly he comes back to a quick summary of what happens on the Day of Atonement. So the high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering. So that's a, a very, very short summary of the Day of Atonement, what happens there. But the body of these animals, they are burned outside the camp. So they are sacrificed and then they are taken outside the camp. And he draws a parallel to Jesus. Jesus suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Uh, where is this? And when he talks about uh, Jesus suffering outside the city gate, he's not merely talking about the physical location. All right, He's talking a little bit more than that. He's, instead of just referring to the physical place, he's talking about the unbelieving world that rejected him and uh, despised Christ. So he's brought outside the city gate, um, outside to a place where he is rejected, outside a place where he's despised, he suffered there. And through that suffering, through that crucifixion, he made the people holy through his blood. And so, verse 13, let us then go to him outside the camp bearing the grace he bore. So, let's identify with him. He went through the same thing. Let's identify with him bearing the disgrace he bore. Now, <coughs> that term, bearing the disgrace he bore, sounds familiar. In chapter 11, we came across that, that phrase. Can you remember who did that? The term disgrace. <coughs> mm. Moses. Moses, thank you. Yeah, so Mo, uh, chapter 11, verse 25, I'll read 25 and 26. He chose to be mistreated, same word, along, same word as we saw in mistreated, along with the people of God rather than to enjoy <coughs> the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace. Same word, for the sake of Christ, as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt, because he was looking forward to his reward. So, <clears throat> so Jesus went to the outside of the city gate. He um, suffered outside there. He bore disgrace there. So let us go to him. We bear the same disgrace that he bore. Just like what Moses did. For, Why? We do not have an enduring city here on earth. We don't have a city that's enduring here on earth. But we are looking for a city that is to come. Again, that sounds familiar. Where is that from? Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. Which character? Which character? Abraham, exactly. <clears throat> so there's a, a lot of callbacks and allusions to what he's been talking about. So we look forward to a city that is to come, just like how Abraham looked forward to a city. Why? Because Jesus is the same yesterday today and forever. The same promise that they have, the same faith that they have, we can have the same faith today, we have the same faith forever. Notice that? So it's all linked together. Um, so a city here on earth, it doesn't endure, but we look forward to a city that does endure, just like Abraham did. So what do we do? We, verse 15, we let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. So like how the Old Testament, we they come and offer God a sacrifice. We also offer a sacrifice of praise. But what does sacrifice of praise mean? Anyone can tell me? How do we even figure out what sacrifice of praise mean? Give your life to God, maybe. How do we find out? We keep reading, thank you. Keep reading. What does he say after that? 
the fruit of lips that openly profess His name. So what does sacrifice of praise mean? means we proclaim and praise God's name. And when we say proclaiming and praise God's name, we're not just, just calling upon God's name all the time, meaning everything about who He is and what He has done. Um, so the sacrifice of praise means we openly profess witness to, talk about, proclaim, preach, share the gospel message and about who God is. That's part of how we praise God, how we offer as a sacrifice to God. So he's just using language in cultic terms, cult, temple language, to talk about our lifestyle today. Um, verse 16, do not forget to do good and to share with others for such sacrifices God is pleased. Uh, so it's the same thing, we do good and share with others, which sounds very f familiar because Paul talks about it as well, but he just uses slightly different terms, slightly different, but very similar. Do you remember where Paul talks about that? Offering a sacrifice to God? Yes. What does he say there? Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. So same kind of idea, we, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, same idea, no, this, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. That's a temple term, a cultic term. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your reasonable or acceptable worship of God, which is, again, what we see here. Like it's uh, in chapter 12, worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. Sounds more and more like Paul who wrote Hebrews, but we'll see. <laughs> um, but there's a lot of similarities there, isn't it? The same themes, uh, same understanding. So, um, uh, we, so we do the same here in verse 15 and 16. And then finally, towards the end of this section where he talks about the leaders, so in verse 17, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authorities because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. So other translations say, obey your leaders and submit to their authority. Same sort of idea, I say. So why should we obey our leaders? Because they are anointed by God, chosen by God. Remember, what, what is the role of the leaders here? What do we learn in verse 7? The role of the leader is to speak the word of God to us. So we listen and we submit to the authority of our leaders because, as well, they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. They need to give an account to God for the way they've conducted their ministry or conducted their leadership. And when they keep watch over you, it means that they look after the lives of all of everybody in their care. Especially those who are prone to spiritual laziness or prone to wander away from the faith. Right? Again, remember we just talked about imitating the faith of past leaders. This is talking about current leaders. Obey or have confidence in your current leaders. You submit to, the, to their authority because they keep watch over you. They make sure and help you to persevere in your faith. So you submit to them. Um, and the main role is to speak the word of God or word of the gospel to the people. And they give an account to God for how they conduct themselves. That's very important. So leadership in Christianity, in, in the Christian church, um, is not primarily about doing a lot of other things. It's about speaking the word of God to the people of God, helping them to persevere in their faith. All right, so, th so that's important. And they're doing this, they're doing this, watching over the people, as people who must give an account to God. They have to give an account to God. They have to answer God and say, this is why I've done such and such. This is how I've um, conducted my ministry. Uh, big responsibility. That's why James 3.1 says, not many of you should be teachers. Are you asking a question, Nanda? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 
Yes, that's right. So when he talks about leaders, he's talking about very specific um, leaders within the community or congregation. Because otherwise, who, who are they talking about? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So, so leaders are very important in the church because the primary role is to preach the word of God, to speak the word of God to you, that great gospel of, salva- gospel of salvation, so that you persevere in your faith. They keep watch over you, and they have to answer to God for how they are doing that. And they set an example. They set an, they set an example exactly, which we saw in uh, verse seven. They are, they are an example, and that's why one of the reasons in First Timothy three, the requirements of being a church. Um, elder, overseer, bishop, pastor, if you read through that um, particular requirement, actually they are quite unremarkable. Like, you know, if you read through it, it's very normal, uh, except one where they must be able to teach. But otherwise, everything else is expected of all Christians. But what the leaders should, uh, are supposed to be doing or their role is to be the example where everybody else can follow. Be the uh, example, the best example of these requirements, so to speak. So part of being a leader of the church that is to um, embody that so that people can follow their examples. Um, so because of all of that, therefore, you submit to their authority, you have confidence in your leaders or your bail leaders. Do this, notice next sentence, so that their work or their ministry will be a joy, not a burden. So that it's a joy for them to be your leaders, not a burden to you. Why? For that will be of no benefit to you. If you are a burden to your leaders in the church, nobody wins. right? Because you are being a burden to your leaders, they can't help you persevere in your faith. You make their lives miserable. You become miserable because you don't get to learn from them and imitate them and hear the gospel message from them. Nobody wins. And if you fall away from your faith, you can't persevere in your faith because the leaders are not doing what they're supposed to do because of what you're doing. There are severe consequences we just see in the wilderness generation. So we submit to uh, the authority of our leaders. We do that so that their work will be a joy so that they are joyful in doing that, not a burden, not a burden. Yeah, so that, you know, you don't wake up every morning, oh man, I gotta preach to our congregation this morning. Oh my, no, it's a joy. You want to be able to do that, right? Um, because if, imagine if somebody, a preacher or Ben goes up to preach and he is a miserable person preaching because he doesn't feel like it. Like, then we know it's our fault. Yeah, nobody wins. <laughs> Nobody wins, right? Um, but if he goes up there and he preaches a sermon that encourages everybody in the gospel, he is joyful, we are joyful, we learn, we persevere in our faith. Yeah. So leadership then in, in the Christian church is understanding what they're supposed to do. They preach the word of God, they help us to persevere on, and we obey them as they do that for us. Um, two-way street. Exactly, it's a two-way street. Uh, and I, I'm happy to say, you know, as part of the leadership in Subi, it is a great, 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 great joy and blessing to be part of this community. And we have been nothing but supported. We have been uh, continually blessed for ev- by everybody in this church. And, and we are very thankful. And I'm personally very, very thankful that we have a wonderful congregation. Yes, uh, Rick. Yeah. That's all part of Yeah. 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 We can trust what they're saying. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That's a great difficulty. Um, that's depends on. Yeah. Yeah. Either change churches. It depends on your role within that church, and yeah. depends on the the constitution of the church, and also the government of the church. So in a church, let's say, for example, if you are in a Baptist church where the congregation holds responsibility and voting rights to be able to bring up issues and vote out the leader, right? you can figure out a way that you can do that to bring it up, constitutionally speaking, to, to do that. Other churches, you may not have that opportunity. So in the Presbyterian church, for example, uh, if you, let's say a leader preaches a false gospel in a Presbyterian church, 
As a member, then, you can write a letter of complaint to the session. The session are, is the body of leaders that oversees the local congregation, the leadership of the local So you can write a letter to a body of governance that is above or that has authority over your local church, and you can complain to them, and then they can launch an investigation on that person. Things like that. So depends on what kind of um, uh, church structure or leadership that you're part of. Uh, but oftentimes, you will find that it is unfortunately very, very, very hard to bring uh, a, a someone who's preaching a false gospel um, unless you are in a very um, well structured, you know, constitution and church. Uh, it's very hard. Uh, if you're a normal member as well, it's very, very hard. Even if you're a leader within the church, it's very hard, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. Not, not to say you don't say anything. You obviously want to try to do what you can um, because, again, that's part of loving others because you're trying to show to them, you know, this leader is preaching a false gospel, but at the same time recognizing the likelihood of changing something or that leader repenting and changing his or her view is very slim generally, unfortunately. But that's, that's being realistic about it. Exactly. Ultimately, they have to give an account to God. Ultimately, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So this is, you know, this doesn't talk all about all parts of what, you know, church leadership is all about. Um, but there are parts like in Acts 20, if you notice, when Paul uh, addresses the, the leaders in Ephesus, and one of the things he says, keep watch over yourselves, keep watch over your doctrine and your lives. Savage wolves will arise from among you, so he's worried about people from within that's going to rise up and have false teachers rather than worrying about what's happening outside. Yes. So part of, you know, for us is that we always have to be careful with that because, because false teachers become false teachers or become popular is because they say what's popular and what's easy to hear a lot of times. Uh, and they tend to be very charismatic as well. Um, uh, um, that's, um, that's the reality because if you're not charismatic who, who's going to listen to you really um, but yeah alright so a quick discussion before we move on what time is it 3.35 excellent so uh, a discussion that I would like you to think about again just people on your own table what were your thoughts about the role of leaders in the church so before we came to this passage what did you think a leader in the church is supposed to be doing you know, what, what were your thoughts about their roles? What are they supposed to be doing? And how have you seen Christians uh, in your life or you yourself view their leaders? How do they see their leaders? What are they supposed to be doing? Good and bad. And how has this passage changed all of that? All right, just talk about that. Uh, and then we'll come back and talk about it very quickly. And then we'll end with a benediction. All right, so take five minutes to discuss that. In your discussion... Uh, what have you, what, you know, what are your own thoughts or what were the thoughts of some Christians around you about the role of the leaders in a church, good or bad? And has there been anything changed uh, since you read this passage in Hebrews? Oh, right, okay. Yeah. He, she, Chong Yi used to think that pastors only work on Sundays. Let me tell you a secret. That's true. No, no. It's not true. <laughs> no. One thing I find is people sometimes, um, it's not the party side, but they go to church because of the minister. Mm. And you've got to be careful because the minister is just the messenger. That's right. Between us and God. That's right. So they idolize or they yes, put the yes. pastor or preacher on a pedestal. Yes. And, that, and that's um, something that uh, unfortunately uh, many Christians do as well. Yeah. So, that's yeah. Yes, that's right. Yeah. yeah, and that's why when sometimes you have church leaders who, who, fall uh, who fall down, who fall from grace, we call it sometimes, yeah. and then, yeah, and a lot of people fall with them, or a lot of people lose their faith, or their faith is um, uh, wavered, so to speak, because of that. Unfortunately, yeah. yeah. So don't put pastors and preachers on a pedestal, yeah. but think about the role. Think about the the preaching of the word itself. Yeah. Other than the preacher. Yeah. Yeah. Because it is the word of God. Yeah. And it's God's 
Yep, exactly. Jenny, you wanted to say something? Mm -hmm. But going back to the first church mm -hmm. in Acts, yes. when there was a need, the apostles Peter said, yep. and the apostles said, yes. we, you mustn't take us away from, from the ministry of the word. And prayer. That's right, exactly. And word prayer. and prayer, yes, very important. And therefore, the congregation elected deacons. Yes. Yes. Preaching the word. Yep. As the job of the Absolutely. Now, um, we, we talked about missionaries. Mm. Well, you know, when persecution came to the church, the missionaries were the ordinary members of the church. Mm. That's right, yeah, exactly. The Holy Spirit said, separate for me Paul and Barnabas. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Although they often meet other needs. Yeah, that's right. Well. That's right. So yeah, the prime role of a missionary is to preach the gospel. Yes. Um, there are different ways you can do that. Yeah. Exactly. That's exactly. Exactly. And it's part of what William Carey did when he was in India. So he had a great um, affinity with different languages, so he did a lot of translation work. He himself wasn't a very good missionary, but he did a lot of translation work that helped a lot of people since then. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Any other thoughts that you came across or any, any discussions about church leadership? Is that an example? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Yep. No, that's right, not for do church leaders. Say, do, as do as I say and do as I do as well. So, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And Paul says that, right? Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Exactly. So, church leaders should not be afraid to say that. It's not arrogance to say that. Um, uh, yeah, that's right. And that's part of what discipleship means as well, because discipleship is not mere knowledge passing on from one to the other. It's also passing on of life examples uh, as well. So, yeah. Any other thoughts before we um, go to the last section? Yeah, and we yes. Past shepherds mm. who shepherd the flock, who mm. tended the needs of the flock. Mm. Even with the pastor, <coughs> they're expected to preach. Yeah, that's right, to preach. So the, the ministry of the word is always primary. Uh, and when I say ministry of the word, I also don't mean just the Sunday morning preaching. Ministry of the word is also trying to bring the word to bear on different life circumstances. Sometimes it's just going to the hospital and reading the word to encourage the person who's in the hospital. Um, uh, but the word must be central in all that we do. Um, yeah. Any other thoughts? Mm-hmm. Mm. I think that's very biblical. So I would just say this. I would say this is like what I see here as well. Mm. Like the follow your leaders and mm. teach you mm. and then implement that as the way you treat others mm. in the world. Yeah. Because that's what Tim Hebrews also said. You better just stay on hold. No. Yeah. Yep. And what you mentioned is this one, Ephesians chapter 4. You know, God gave um, pastors, um, elders, teachers to teach you, to equip you, so that you can do the work of ministry. So notice the work of ministry is done by the people in the church, not the pastors, so to speak. All right. They're there to equip you so that you can do the work of ministry, particularly as you go out into the world to work, to interact with the world, to be salt and light in the world uh, in that way. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. <clears throat> All right, let's move on um, to the last section I call benediction from verse 18 to 25. So the pastor is not afraid to say pray for us in verse 18. 
um, we are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably in every way. So even the pastor needs prayer. He's not afraid to ask for prayer. And he has a clear conscience because he recognizes his conscience has been cleansed by Christ. Uh, so I'm going to run, run very quickly through, through a lot of this and then I'll stop in some interesting bits. Uh, interesting that in verse 19, I particularly urge you to pray so that I may be restored to you soon. It means that he is not with them at this point in time. Where is he? Exactly, we don't know. Hint is that it put possibly that he is in prison. Uh, we, again, we don't know because in verse 23, he does say, I want you to know that our brother Timothy has been released. Now, how does he know that? Maybe he was in prison as Timothy was released. So that's a possibility. It's not a concrete thing. We don't know for sure. Um, but if he is in prison, that makes his comments about remembering those in prison all the more important, isn't it? Because he is there in prison. Um, but wherever it is, the idea here as we read this is that we know that he is not with the, um, the hearers. And therefore, he is praying that he can be restored to them. Okay, And then we have come to verse 20 and 21, which is a wonderful, wonderful benediction. Uh, I'll uh, read very, those two verses, and then I'll comment bits and pieces here and there. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant, brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So, he is now giving a benediction in uh, verse 20 and 21. May the God of peace, um, who through the blood of the eternal covenant. So, this is a benediction. Hopefully, as I read through the two verses, you notice themes that he has been covering throughout the whole book, popping up uh, in these two verses, um, or words that he's using. Blood, the sacrifice of Christ that we talked about in chapters 8 and 9 and 10, really, of the eternal covenant. It's talking about that covenant that Christ has accomplished through his sacrifice and now eternally is ours, eternal blessing that we have in Christ. In a sense that uh, this blessing, this efficacy of the sacrifice, it will continue on eternally. Who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus. So our Lord Jesus who was dead, now he's been resurrected, raised from the dead. He's bringing... Um, Jesus back from the dead. He is the great shepherd of the sheep. So this idea of shepherd, um, he, does, he hasn't touched too much in the sermon, but this is a theme that's very common throughout the Old Testament. So for example, let me um, give you a quote from Isaiah 63 verse 11. If you read that verse, go home and read it. Uh, verse 63, 11, he gives the picture or depicts Moses as a shepherd leading the sheep of Israel. So Moses led Israel like a shepherd. And then what, what is another very, very famous psalm that depicts God as a shepherd? Psalm 23, exactly. So Yahweh or God is depicted as a shepherd. And then when we come to Jesus, what does he say? I am the good shepherd in John chapter 10. So this idea of the shepherd is very common throughout the Old Testament. Ezekiel 34 is a very common one. John chapter 10 is where uh, Jesus um, pronounces that. So he is the great shepherd of the sheep, which is the people of God. Uh, so he hasn't talked a lot about that, but as you, as you can see, it's steep with Old Testament allusions. Now verse 21 is an interesting one. This great shepherd of the sheep, or this God of peace, May he equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him. So God asks us to do his will, right, to persevere. He is praying this God will equip us with everything good to do so. So God commands us, but he also gives us the ability to obey those commands. So a great um, prayer by Augustine in the 5th century BC, uh, 5th century, not BC, 5th century, is a very, very famous um, prayer. He says, give what you command, command what you will. That is, give God, he's praying to God, give to me the ability of strength of what you command, and then you command whatever you like. So this idea where God enables us to be able to obey him. So we, 
uh, recognize God gives us all these commands. Sometimes we think it is impossible, but then we also recognize, no, it is God who equips us to do that. So, um, let me give you a very famous passage that I use all the time. Uh, let's go to if, if Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Again, we read this verse, we know this verse very well, but sometimes we forget the second half of that verse, or the, rather the next verse. Chapter 2, verse 12. Uh, chapter 2, verse 12. Okay, everyone there? So, he just talked about Christ, to imitate Christ, uh, and things like that. Verse 12, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in, in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So this is a call. This is a ob- command that you're supposed to obey. Why? Notice the next verse. For it is God who works in in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose why do we obey we obey because god is one working in you notice that so god commands all these things but at the same time he gives us the ability to obey his commands and he's working in us another famous one uh, another one that um, we can find in leviticus uh, this is the last passage i'll go to and then we'll end go to leviticus chapter 20 Leviticus chapter 20. Leviticus chapter 20. Are we on there? Chapter 20, verse 7. Now, so let me read that. Consecrate yourselves and be holy. Because I am the Lord your God. So, God commands you, consecrate yourselves, be holy. Right? That's what he asked the Israelites to do. Keep my decrees, follow them. Notice that. I am the Lord who makes you holy. See that? So, he's asking the Israelites to be holy. He's asking them to follow his decrees. I am the Lord who makes you holy. So, so God gives us the ability to obey His command. So, um, what Augustine prayed, give what you command, give to us the strength, the ability, what you command, and command what you will. Command what you will. So, in the same thing we read here, may the God of peace who through the blood of eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, all these commands that he's t- told us to persevere, to obey, to honor marriage, to show brotherly love to one another, etc., etc. Verse 21, equip you with everything good for doing his will. May he work in us what is pleasing to him. Through Jesus Christ, to him be glory forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> Alright, so notice that. It's very important. So God doesn't leave us to our own devices. God helps us. God gives us the ability to obey his commands. Then verse 22 onwards, um, in, uh, yeah, verse 22, there's also another play on words that again we sometimes miss it in our English. Somehow they change the word. So verse 22, brothers and sisters, I urge you to bear with my word of exaltation. If you uh, translate it consistently with the Greek, it will be, I exhort you to bear with my word of exaltation. And it's the same word, same uh, uh, uh root word i exhort you to bear with my word of exhortation why for i have written to you quite briefly so 13 chapters it's not very long it's very short actually not long at all Uh, but this word of exhortation generally is a common phrase used to describe a homily or a sermon in a synagogue Um, and that's part of the reasons why i think this is a sermon however as he ends this letter Oh, sorry, as he ends this, it sounds like a letter. Right? I want you to know our brother Timothy has been released. If he arrives soon, I'll come to him. Greet all your leaders and all lost people. For those who are in Italy, send you their greeting. Grace be with you. That's 
the standard formatting for a letter. What's going on? So is it a sermon or is it a letter? It's both. So that's why you, you have that um, comment there that I wrote down from Cockrell. The pastor then has ended what has appeared up to now to be a sermon as if it were a letter. The simplest explanation for this situation is that the author of Hebrews was not able to deliver a sermon in person, so he committed it to writing and sent it to be read to the congregation over which he was so gravely concerned. This letter ending then is no claim to Pauline authorship, meaning it's not necessarily meaning it's um, a letter from Paul. It's very similar to the endings of the letter of the Paul, but that doesn't mean it is from Paul. However, by, appear, by appending this ending, he is associating his message with the other early Christian letters in our New Testament and claiming his place as a faithful interpreter of the message of Christ handed down through the apostles. So he's identifying with the messages that Paul preached, uh, uh, Paul preached in and through his letters. Also shows that he is um, aware of what's going on, aware of um, Paul's letters, aware of Paul's network of disciples and apostles. So our brother Timothy has been released. Uh, most likely is referring to the Timothy that Paul writes to in Acts chapter 16 and also the two letters that we have in the New Testament. So the most possible is the same Timothy. Because of this, some people have said Paul is the author of Hebrews. Uh, maybe. It's possible. Not necessarily. It is possible. Uh, if you Want to argue for that? I'm not going to stop you. I don't think... Yeah, it's one way or another. I don't know. Uh, um, but it goes to show that the pastor or the author of Hebrews is somebody who's close to a network of people who know Christ, who's close to Paul. right? So he's close to that group of people. Um, and finally he ends, you know, greet everybody, greet those who are in Italy. Uh, those from Italy send you, send you greetings. Again, it's hard to tell who is he talking about. Is he with it? Sorry? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. In Rome, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yep. yep. And then finally, grace be with you all is a very common and standard ending to a letter. So, just like Paul, grace from God, based on what we have just learned from uh, about Christ. So, let me... <clears throat> Four o'clock, perfect. Let me finish with this. Uh, that final page. Towards the end of Hebrews, the pastor calls his hearers to worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. He continues to explain how that looks like in the life of a Christian. He tells his hearers, not readers, hearers, to continue their love for one another, including those who are in prison. Honoring ma marriage and loving, uh, living a life of contentment was all, were also emphasized. He exhorts his hearers to remember their past leaders. They are to consider the outcome of their lives, to imitate the example of their faith as they persevered. These leaders spoke the word of God about the great salvation of Christ to them. Thus, from this passage, we can reason that one of the main roles of a Christian leader is to speak the word of God, the gospel message, to us. And given what the author or the pastor has touched about in this book, about the importance of the word of God, it's not surprising, isn't it? He's constantly emphasizing how important it is and how uh, unique it is and how serious it is that we obey that word. God has spoken to his people in many different ways in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, he has spoken to us by his son or in his son. The only way we can read and find out more about this Jesus now is through the scriptures. So leaders today, we preach from the scriptures, not from our own experiences. We preach from the scriptures. That is why later on the pastor calls his hearers to have confidence and submit to their leader's authority. If they do not, they will be a burden to, do, to these leaders and having overburdened leaders are of no benefit to them. This is because the leaders are supposed to speak the word of God to everyone and by burdening them, they have less time or opportunity to do so. And that means the leaders are not serving everyone with a joyful heart. And when that happens, there will be of no benefit to his hearers, particularly if the result is unfaithfulness. The least leaders then are there to keep watch over us, helping us to persevere in our faith. They do this as people who must give an account to God. And there's something that I'm always, always, always aware of. He ends his sermon with a wonderful benediction that once again reiterates most of what he has covered so far. In particular, he acknowledges that God is the one who equips us to do everything good for his evil. What? For his... What? Will. Why did I write evil? That's a mistake there. Everything good for his will, 
for doing his will. Sorry. All right, let's end here. <laughs> I'm glad you're all paying attention and you're not falling asleep. That's good. I was just testing you all. all, right, all right. Anyway, um, to do everything good for, uh, for everything good for doing His will, rather. This is quoting from that in verse 20. Working in us what is pleasing to Him. God achieves in us what is most pleasing to Him. To Him be all glory. And um, if you notice in my um, uh, annual report, and when I sign off, I use Soli Deo Gloria. Anyone knows what that means? Soli Deo. Glory to God alone. And that's what we want. Glory to God alone. Be to Him be all glory. That's in the Latin. Soli Deo Gloria. Soli Deo Gloria. I don't have a marker here. Gloria, yes. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for persevering through this course. And I hope and pray this has been helpful to you uh, that you can come and appreciate and know the book of Hebrews just a little bit better and know how it functions and how uh, it's structured and how um, the, the pastor argues for um, that the whole Old Testament points to Christ. Christ is the center um, and I pray that this has helped you appreciate Christ all the more. Okay? If you have any more questions about the book of Hebrews, come and talk to me after this. I'll be more than happy to uh, let you know. And all of these sessions are recorded, so if you're watching, if you want to, you know, after a while you want to go back and watch it again, you can. It's all going to be on YouTube. I know there's one person who's always watching it right now. Hi. Um, uh, and... Uh, if, again, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. I'm happy to answer and help you through that. Let me pray, and then we, we can finish. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for what he has done, what he has accomplished, and now we can approach you with great confidence, approach your throne of grace with great confidence. Uh, and now we, uh, as our brothers and sisters in Christ, we can uh, persevere on in our faith, and we pray, Father, that you help us to do that. Uh, help us and equip us, Lord, with everything good for doing your will so that you can work in us what is pleasing to you. And we pray, Father, as uh, we have read just now, um, that all glory be to you in our lives. So, Father, we ask and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.